Universal Precautions from Nanatuck Resource Associates. Welcome and thank you for taking this training. It is one of many trainings to help people stay safe and prepare for the unexpected. Today, we will be talking about what universal precautions are, bloodborne pathogens, protocols for safety, exposure, and a quiz to wrap things up at the end. Universal precautions, what are they? Universal precautions are recommended practices used to minimize the risk of exposure to infectious diseases and pathogens carried in blood and bodily fluids. Bloodborne pathogens. Bloodborne pathogens are infectious microorganisms in blood that can cause disease in people. Examples of bloodborne pathogens include hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Hepatitis B. Hepatitis B can be transmitted by blood, sexually transmitted, transmitted through IV drug users, through household contact, such as sharing razors, toothbrushes, sharing drinking cups and utensils. It can be treated with medications and vaccines are available for hepatitis B. Hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is primarily bloodborne can be sexually transmitted, prenatal, can be transmitted by blood-to-blood -blood contact, such as non-sterile tattoos, syringes, or cuts. There is no vaccine currently available, but it may be treated with medication if chronic and causing liver damage. HIV and AIDS. AIDS stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. For prevention, follow universal precautions such as hand washing, proper handling and disposal of sharps and contaminated materials, cleaning and disinfecting after any contact with blood, and personal protection barriers such as gloves, masks, and goggles. Common ways of being exposed to pathogens. Some common ways of being exposed to pathogens include nosebleeds, lost teeth, cuts, vomit, bathroom accidents and soiled clothing, contaminated surfaces, and tissues and bandages. Modes of pathogen transmission. Modes of pathogen transmission include contact from skin to skin or from contaminated surfaces, airborne infectious particles, and droplets from sneezing, coughing, or talking. Body fluids. When dealing with any body fluids, err on the side of caution and take necessary measures to assume every person has an infectious disease. Protocols for safety. Essential techniques used to control infections are effective hand hygiene, using gloves and other barriers, disposing of waste appropriately, and cleaning spills promptly, carefully, and thoroughly. Hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the single most important activity to decrease the spread of infections of all kinds. Wash your hands after using the restroom, before eating, before touching your mouth, face, or eyes. Be sure to use warm water, soap, and a cloth to dry off. Waterless hand sanitizer may be used if there is no visible soiling of hands, though it should not be substituted for soap and water. Always wash with soap and water after several uses of hand sanitizer. Wash hands after wearing gloves. Apply a dime-sized amount of soap or cleaner to the hands. Rub hands vigorously for 10 to 15 seconds. Scrub between fingers, under nails, tops of hands, and wrists. Singing Yankee Doodle or Happy Birthday in their entirety will ensure you've spent enough time washing. Barriers. Always wear gloves or place some type of barrier between you and the person you are caring for. And always wear gloves during cleanup procedures. Skin wounds. Skin wounds such as scratches, abrasions, lacerations, and weeping skin lesions are potentially infectious. Cover all wounds with a secure bandage. If possible, the injured person should perform his or her own wound care. 
Pressure to stop a bleeding wound. Always wear gloves. Gloves should never be reused. And apply a new bandage over the bandage if saturated with blood. Cleanup procedure. Always use disposable towels for cleaning up blood or body fluids. Clean surfaces with an approved disinfectant. Wet surface with disinfectant, leave on wet for 10 minutes and then wipe dry. All materials contaminated with blood and or body fluids should be double bagged in a trash liner and sealed. Gloves should be disposed of in the trash. Trash liners should not be reused and trash should be discarded as soon as possible. Non-disposable cleaning equipment and materials. Mop heads should be disinfected with work-approved disinfectant. Any linens should be stored in a plastic bag until laundry. Thoroughly wash hands after cleaning, even if gloves are worn. Used needles, syringes, and other sharp objects. Needles should not be recapped, bent, or removed from the syringe before disposal. In homes where sharps are used, a designated container is kept for all used needles. When the container is three quarters full, notify your manager to request a pickup. Visit www.massmedwaste.com for additional information on proper disposal and pickup. Respiratory etiquette. Always cover mouth and nose when coughing and sneezing. Use a tissue to cover mouth or blow nose and dispose of in trash. Use sleeve or arm instead of hands. And wash hands or use hand sanitizer after sneezing and coughing or blowing your nose. Exposure. Do not share towels, cups and utensils, razors, or toothbrushes. Even though bloodborne pathogens have not been shown to be transmitted in saliva, you should not share personal items. Bloodborne pathogen infections, even when treated, may sometimes be fatal. Hello, my name is Shannon Stanley, and I'm going to be taking you through a lecture today on infection control. So to start off with, we'll have a look at the contents that we're going to cover in this next section. Firstly, we will talk about the different type of infectious agents that are out there that lead to somebody obtaining a disease, how disease is transmitted from one person to another. Um, this occurs through the chain of infection and uh, understanding the chain of infection is highly important uh, for the work that we do, especially when it comes to procedures of infection control, um, because through these infection control procedures, this is how we can stop infection spreading from one person to another. Infectious agents are biological agents that can cause infection and disease. Organisms are said to be pathogenic and what this means is that they are considered to be the origin of most diseases. The different types of infectious agents are bacteria, viruses, fungi and parasites. So bacteria are the first pathogenic agent that we're going to be having a look at. And you can see there's a picture of what bacteria look like underneath a microscope um, down in the right hand corner. From the picture, you can see that they're quite simple in structure and they're only one cell large or what they call as unicellular organisms. And they are spread right throughout our environments. They have the ability of living independently of other organisms. And what that means is that Bacteria do not need a human or animal host to survive. They're quite happy to um, survive and breed and replicate on any kind of object. So that could be something um, like a desk or the shower floor or a mobile phone or money, for example. Um, so they do not need a human or animal host to survive or live off. Bacteria are treated by antibiotics or bacterial infections are treated with antibiotics. Um, and there's a very big misconception in the community of why antibiotics are used uh, to treat certain things and not. Most people believe that antibiotics are there to treat any type of infection um, that a human gets. And that's not true. It's only for bacterial infections. Most bacteria are actually very useful and only some are said to be pathogenic. So we have 
millions of bacteria living on our skin um, and the whole way through our digestive tract. Um, and they're very, very helpful for a number of different reasons. And using an example here is we have quite a lot of bacteria right through our gastrointestinal tract, and they're very important for aiding in digestion. But if they move out of the digestive tract into another cavity or into another place, such as the um, peritoneum, they can cause a very serious infection. And this is exactly the same, like we have bacteria inside of our mouth or our oral cavity, and the bacteria has a very important fit and function there. But if that bacteria goes to another area, such as your lungs, um, that can cause things like bacterial pneumonia, um, which are pretty severe. So a couple of examples of different type of bacterial infections is E. coli, Salmonella, Streptococcus, uh, TB, or tuberculosis, tetanus, syphilis, and thrush. And you'll notice that with a lot of medical conditions um, or diseases, you might have a bacterial infection of that and a viral infection, so caused by different things. Example of this is meningitis. So meningitis, which is inflammation of the meninges running around the brain and spinal cord, is a very serious condition and it can be caused by a bacterial infection and a viral infection and then it'll be defined as bacterial meningitis or viral meningitis. Viruses are very different to bacteria in their shape, structure and functions. Unlike bacteria, a virus cannot survive without a susceptible host and it cannot live independently from a host either. Viruses are known to be intracellular parasites, and this is due to the nature of how they function. So once they've invaded an organism, they actually use the organism's cell to hide away from the natural defenses of that organism and to multiply. This makes them incredibly difficult to treat because once a virus invades the cell, it can only be killed by destroying the whole cell. And this has resulted to all current treatments of any type of viral infection um, is solely aimed at treating the symptoms of that virus and not about destroying the virus itself. Viruses can mutate and so they become very resistant to drugs and medications. Um, so the main defense against our viruses are actually vaccinations and inoculations. Common different ty types of viruses are um, things like the common colds, chickenpox, measles, mumps, rubella, certain types of pneumonia, the Ebola virus, which has been very big in the news as of late, and uh, the AIDS or HIV virus. Fungi are a different type of infectious agent um, that again is different to viruses and bacteria and its shape, structure and its nature. Um, fungi are organisms that are more like plants than animals and these include uh, yeasts and molds. Fungi can be present in soil, air and water. So fungi are very different to bacteria and viruses in the sense that they are very happy living independently of any kind of human or animal host. Um, but when they do come into contact with a human or an animal host, they're a, a pathogen that causes a very slow development of a disease. Um, they're usually more mildly irritating compared to being fatal. Um, the only cases where fungi can cause more severe effects is in patients um, that have very low or impaired immune systems. For example, in an HIV patient with a very low immune system, uh, fungi can invade the lungs, the blood and several organs and have quite detrimental effects um, on those types of patients. Examples of different kind of fungi uh, infections are things like ringworm, athlete's foot and thrush. The last type of pathogenic agent we're going to have a look at are parasites. So parasites need to live and to feed off other organisms. They don't live very well independently of organisms, only for very short periods of time. They can cause mildly annoying to very fatal diseases. Most worm infections are spread via feces um, that contaminate food and water sources. And the most common places that practitioners will see this is in developing countries where there's inadequate supply of fresh and clean water sources and of good sanitation practices. Different types of examples of parasites are things like roundworms, 
pinworms, hookworms, flatworms, and tapeworms and flukes. Now these would be causing more um, minor infections in an individual, but you can get very severe infections such as Bilharzia infections without treatment um, that can be fatal. In this next section, we'll be having a look at disease transmission and control. So first off, we'll discuss the different modes of transmission and the chain of infection. And then we'll have a look at different infection control methods and the importance of using things such as personal protective equipment, how to dispose of contaminated waste products and managing needle stick injuries. In order for a disease or a pathogen to um, be spread from one person to another or from an animal to another, it needs to have a mode of transmission. The first type of mode of transmission is through direct or physical contact. Now, this is one of the easiest ways for a pathogen to enter into the human body because it bypasses a lot of the body's natural defense mechanisms. So examples of this would be through oral contact, through contact through the eye, intravascular injections, uh, fecal contamination, and through sexual contact. Another mode of transmission is through what's called indirect contact. So this is where something has not immediately been passed from one body source to another. An example of this would be um, if somebody was to sneeze onto a table surface or somebody was to cough an infectious agent onto a table surface and the infectious agent could live outside that host for a while. Another person would come along and touch that surface and maybe wipe their nose or rub their eye or even touch their mouth and this would be a portal then for an infectious agent to enter into their body. So this is not direct contact, the organism needs to survive on an animate or inanimate object for a time without a human host. The next and very effective mode of transmission is through droplet transmission. So all those people who don't cover their mouths um, or cover up their noses when they sneeze or cough um, have the ability to spread infection through the droplets that they cough or sneeze out of their bodies and somebody else would breathe that in and that would cause transmission of the disease. Infections and diseases can only spread when the conditions are right. So we call these set of conditions the chain of infection. There are six links to the chain of infection and all of these need to be intact in order for the spread of infection to occur from one organism to another. The first is the pathogenic agent. So examples of this is a bacteria, virus, fungi, or parasite. So this needs to be present in order for an infection to take place. The next is the reservoir. This reservoir source is where the infectious agent can normally live and multiply. And examples of this can be a human, animal, insect, um, in the soil, or any kind of contaminated food or water source. There needs to be a portal of exit. So this organism needs to move, uh, sorry, this pathogenic agent needs to move from one reservoir source or organism to another. So it can exit via things like the respiratory tract, intestinal tract, through sexual contact, open wounds, blood, or bodily fluids. There needs to be an environment conducive for the mode of transmission. So this can be either through direct, indirect contact or through droplet transmission. Then there needs to be a portal of entry into the new organism. Um, an uh, infectious agent can enter into the new organism via things like the respiratory tract, intestinal tract, um, through sexual contact, open wounds and mucous membranes such as the eye or mouth. The last link in the chain of infection is the host susceptibility. So this determines whether somebody um, will or will not get infected by this pathogenic agent that has been passed from one individual to another. Things that can affect the host susceptibility um, are age. So for the very young and the very old or debilitated um, would have a generally low immune system and a low ability to fight off infections. Those who are immunocompromised due to poor nutrition or health, um, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, and different types of medical conditions would naturally have a lower immune system and find it harder to fight off these infectious agents. So again, 
all of these elements need to be intact in order for infection to spread from one individual or one source to another. Infection control practices are very important for breaking the chain in the spread of disease. Some important infection control practices include effective hand washing, personal hygiene, and cleaning and disinfecting of our equipment. The first infection control procedure we'll have a look at is effective hand washing. Now, as medical practitioners, we're going to be coming into contact with many different types of patients. Some patients may be highly infectious and have infective Asians on their skin or in the atmosphere around them, and other patients might be very immunocompromised. And it's important that we as medical practitioners are not aiding the transmission of disease. So we need to follow procedures like effective hand washing. So very important, we wash our hands before and after contact with every single patient. We need to make sure that we have soap and running water and as well as some disposable towels at the end to dry our hands with. I'm going to give you a few seconds to have a look at the chart in front of you. Read through all the instructions carefully and then we'll move on to the next slide. Personal hygiene is another important aspect of infection control and by practicing good personal hygiene practices we also help to break the chain of infection. So very important to wear a clean uniform with each and every shift. Ensure that nails are kept short and clean um, and this means no artificial nails either. Artificial nails, long nails and excessive jewellery is a breeding ground for bacteria and often these areas are not cleaned appropriately when performing the good hand washing techniques. So it's very important to keep nails short, no artificial nails and no excessive jewellery. And again just ensure that you're washing hands before and after contact with every patient. Cleaning and disinfection is just as important as personal hygiene and hand washing. It's important that you clean all personal and ambulance equipment after use with each patient. The cleaning detergent or disinfection solution will be provided to you and approved of by your service. Ensure that you're also cleaning the inside and the outside of your ambulance after each shift or after you've had a highly infectious patient. As a medical practitioner or healthcare provider, personal protective equipment make up part of your uniform. Personal protective equipment or PPE consists of gloves, masks, safety glasses, and clothing or your uniform. Gloves make up the most important part of your personal protective equipment when attending to cases. Um, gloves provide that extra barrier between your skin and the patient and this helps to ensure that your skin isn't exposed to um, as many bacteria and viruses as it would be if you were to not be wearing gloves. So we make sure that we use a pair of gloves with every single patient and this is a single use only. Now keep in mind that when we are using gloves regardless of whether a patient is bleeding, has bodily fluids, is highly infectious or not, um, that you are protecting yourself by using a pair of gloves, but you're also protecting immunocompromised patients from anything that you may be carrying as well. Gloves must meet the government regulations and specifications set out by Australian standards. And um, whenever you are removing a pair of gloves, it's very important to ensure that you're turning them inside out. And in this way, if your gloves are contaminated with any waste products, you're confining it to a certain area when you're disposing of them. Ensure that you also use gloves when you're cleaning your equipment and your vehicle um, because they have been contaminated and when you are cleaning your gear, um, if you just wear a pair of gloves while doing that, you're also just adding that extra protection to yourself. And lastly, just make sure that you are washing your hands after you remove your gloves every time. Masks and goggles or safety glasses are very important for providing protection to your eyes and mouth. Um, and it provides protection against things such as saliva, blood spray, 
um, vomitus or any other type of body fluids. Um, the eyes and the mouth are an easy portal of entry for an infection into the body, so it provides a barrier from, and stops that from occurring. So very important to keep your safety goggles on you at all times, uh, particularly when you're anticipating any splashes of body fluids or blood. Immunizations also help protect you against many of the pathogens that you'll come into contact with as a healthcare provider. The different immunizations would help protect you against things such as hepatitis A and B, tetanus, the flu virus, and you may also get the triple antigen which is protecting you against diphtheria, tetanus and whooping cough. Depending on where you work, your organization may require you to have some or all of these or even more of these um, to ensure that you can work safely in your work environment. Exposure. If blood or body substances gets into contact with the skin, then watch that exposed site with soap and water. Wherever there's no water available, use a non-water-based cleanser such as an alcohol solution or an antiseptic solution. If blood or other body substances gets into the eyes, rinse them thoroughly with water or normal saline. Do not use any harsh chemicals on the eyes. If blood or other body substances gets into the mouth, then spit them out and rinse the mouth thoroughly several times with water. Needle stick injuries have the capacity to spread infections such as hepatitis or HIV or AIDS virus. In the event of a needle stick injury occurring, you need to wash the injured area with copious amounts of soapy water, disinfectant, scrub solution, or just water if that's all you have. Ensure you report the incident, document it effectively, and dispose of the shops safely. Waste needs to be disposed of appropriately and effectively. Needles and sharps need to go into a sharps container only. Needles and sharps are not allowed or should not go into any normal waste bin or any contaminated waste bin besides a sharps container. Other soft contaminated waste needs to be disposed of in contamination waste bags. This includes any product that has blood or bodily fluid on it. It is important that any scene we attend, we need to clean and make sure there is no waste left on scene. So in regard to isolation and reporting, if you've come into contact with a highly infectious disease case, then report the incident to a senior officer or operations manager immediately. You may need to be isolated or removed from duty and your vehicle and equipment will need to be cleaned and disinfected appropriately. So it's very important that you are aware of your work health safety policies and procedures in your workplace. Some take home points in conclusion to this PowerPoint are Pathogenic agents such as bacteria, fungi, and viruses cause disease. In order for disease to be transmitted from one person to another, the chain of infection needs to be intact. We as practitioners are responsible for maintaining and practicing infection control procedures to prevent the spread of disease. Okay. I want to go over with you a bag technique. When I talk about a bag technique, this is the correct way to um, carry in your bag and make sure you don't cross contaminate um, things uh, from one client to another, okay? So, I want to say that with your bag that you carry in, I have seen some home health aides and nurses that their bags are bulging. They have everything but the kitchen sink in that bag. And that really you're asking for trouble. You should have some boxes, totes in your trunk, in your car, a clean one and a dirty area. That's where you keep your extra supplies. You only carry in with your bag what you need for that client specifically. Okay? So your bag, if it does not have wheels, does not go on the floor at all. No wheels, no floor. Okay? So you come into the home, you you absolutely when you walk in that door you hand sanitize. Now your bag will have three main compartments. The first compartment is called the dirty area. Now nothing in there is really dirty, 
but we call it the dirty area because it's an area you can access without sanitizing your hands. So the first thing you're going to do is get out a barrier and put it down so that you can set your bag on it. Okay? Now you get out two more barriers and you place one. I like to place the one on each side of my bag because that helps me keep it separated. One side is for the dirty and the other side is for the clean and I really don't think it matters just so you keep them separate. Okay, now in the quote dirty side we again have the barriers and then we have hand sanitizer and some antimicrobial soap. I also keep a garbage bag, just a little trash bag at all times. Now, I have heard some places that are not providing um, barriers, and if that is the case, um, these are doggy doo-doo bags. I know that's weird, but I really like to use them. You can just pull them out and put it down and you can use that for your barriers. And I also like them because it never fails when I'm ready to leave a client's home. There's always a little something I forgot, a piece of trash or something, and I can just put it right in here and throw it away. Not only that, but sometimes your clients don't always have trash bags. Um, you see a lot. You see a lot of different settings and things. Um, so I always just carry these. They come with a nice little clip and I can put them on the side. That's up to you though. Okay, now I have this barrier for my bag. I have a clean and a dirty side. The other two compartments on my bag, this compartment would be either for my laptop or for my paperwork. And you don't bring everybody's paperwork in, just client specific paperwork. If you're not in this section of your bag, you keep it zipped. Always keep your bag zipped. You want to keep it clean. Okay, then I have the clean section of my bag. I do not access this until I hand sanitize. This is considered the clean section. So, now that I have my barriers down, I'm going to go ahead and pull out my hand sanitizer and soap and put them down. Now, it's okay for me to use um, hand sanitizer most of the time. When you use your hand sanitizer, you rub until it is all dry. You don't wave your hands in the air until it dries. You give friction in all areas until your hands are dry. Okay. Now, the, when you should use the soap, definitely is when they're visibly soiled, they're sticky, um, things like that. Otherwise, the hand sanitizer is considered okay. All right, so I've sanitized my hands. Now I'm going to enter the, quote, clean area of the bag. So I'm going to unzip, and as you can see in here, I have all my equipment for um, doing vital signs. I'm gonna put these out. Now these are clean because I cleaned them from my last client. Every time, I, uh, before I put them back in here, they have to be cleaned. And you always start from the clean to the dirty. So that would mean that if I was cleaning my stethoscope, I start with the earpieces and move down to the bell. Get another one, start with the earpiece, move down to the bell. Okay? And I have to do that before I can put them back into my bag. The same thing with this. I would start the cleanest and go to the dirtiest. Okay? And I would I need to do that before I put it back into my bag. Alright. So that is your bagging technique. So let's recap to make sure you remember. There's a clean and a dirty side and then a documentation component in your bag. The dirty side is going to have your barriers, hand sanitizer, and your um, soap. And on the clean side, you're going to have your um, vital signs um, equipment, your gloves, your wipes, 
um, and so forth. They are clean because you cleaned them before you left your last client's home and they will be cleaned again before you enter them in. When you take things out of a section of your bag, you zip it back up again. Okay. And that is um, your bag technique for home health. The law defines sexual harassment as unwelcome verbal, visual, or physical conduct of a sexual nature that is severe or pervasive and affects working conditions or creates a hostile work environment. Conduct of a sexual nature is broken into three parts, verbal, visual, and physical. Verbal includes comments about clothing, a person's body, sexual or gender-based jokes or remarks, requesting sexual favors or repeatedly asking a person out, sexual innuendos, threats, spreading rumors about a person's personal or sexual life, or foul and obscene language. Visual includes posters, drawings, pictures, screensavers, cartoons, emails, or text of a sexual nature. Physical includes assault, impeding or blocking movement, inappropriate touching such as kissing, hugging, patting, stroking or rubbing, sexual gesturing, or even leering or staring. There are two categories of sexual harassment. The first is quid pro quo, which literally means this for that. It occurs when a boss seizes job rewards such as raises or promotions or punishment such as demotions or firing to force employees into a sexual relationship or sexual act. The second is hostile environment, which is defined as conduct that unreasonably interferes with work performance or creates an intimidating, hostile, or offensive work environment. For example, it may be sexual harassment if repeated sexual comments make someone so uncomfortable that their work performance suffers or they decline professional opportunities because it will put them in contact with the harasser. In both types of harassment, employees must prove that the conduct was offensive to someone, not necessarily the intended victim of the harassment. Here is an example. Say a male employee tells a dirty joke to a female coworker. She thinks it's funny, but a second woman passing by finds it offensive. That joke could contribute to a hostile environment claim simply because someone finds it offensive. There are two conditions that determine liability for employers in cases of hostile environment sexual harassment. The employer knew or should have known about the harassment and the employer failed to take appropriate corrective action. Having a training program as well as a clear procedure for reporting harassment claims can shield employers from expensive lawsuits. Visit us at turnkeydoc.com for more tips on how to prevent sexual harassment, training materials, as well as a complete library of company policy and procedures. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for free video tips every month. Hi, my name's Simon. I'm one of the final year medical students. Can I just check your name and age, please? Yeah, it's Andrew and I'm 25. Nice to meet you, Andrew. So today I'd like to check a blood sugar reading, if that's okay. That'll involve me taking a small blood sample from the end of your fingertip. Does that sound all right? Yeah, that's fine. And can I just ask you to go and wash your hands quickly with some soap and water, please? Okay. Whilst you wash your hands, I'll just assemble my equipment. If you could just put your hand on the table for me, I'm going to take the blood sample now. So you might feel a sharp scratch. Okay. okay. Sharp scratch. Just pinch your finger together for me. Okay, Andrew, that completes the procedure. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. To complete the procedure, I will document the patient's capillary blood glucose 